Hello and welcome to a, another U.S. History One lesson. This one's called the Market Revolution. I wanted to say first congratulations on surviving your midterm exam. And I also want to say uh, today is July 6th. For anybody who emails me between now, July 6th, and Monday, July the 12th, before 11.59 p.m. and says that they watched this video, I will give you five points on your midterm exam. So once again, today is July 6th. It's about 4.40 p.m. If anybody emails me between right now and Monday, July 12th at 11.59 p.m. and says, hey, I watched your video, you will get five points added to your midterm exam. Now that that's out of the way, we're going to talk about the market revolution today. And the first thing we're going to look at is what's called the moral economy. And this is going to be the economy that existed before capitalism took over. And the moral economy, this is a pre-capitalist society. And it's a group of people living in these interdependent communities. They're going to grow crops for their own subsistence. They're these people, are, they're not really interested in making money. They're not interested in profit. And they're going to trade goods and they're going to trade labor with their neighbors. I mean, maybe somebody has a lot of wheat and their neighbor has a lot of corn. They'll, they'll trade it with each other instead of selling it. Or maybe somebody's really good at making barns while somebody's really good at making houses. They'll exchange there too. So this is very much more a personal credit system. This is not a true barter system. There is still some money trading hands, but it's much more on owing somebody on the personal level. If there is a surplus of crops or if there is a surplus of some product, that's going to be sold mainly to pay bills or to pay taxes. Once again, in the moral economy, um, it's just not about making money. Within the moral economy, uh, men and women, they have different duties. Uh, the women are responsible for keeping up the inside of the house. The women are responsible for cooking, food preservation, tending gardens, poultry, dairy animals, and making the textiles, making the clothes. Um, making the textiles, that's going to involve spinning, weaving, dyeing, clothing, sewing, mending, all of that. Men, on the other hand, uh, they're going to attend the field jobs. They're going to take care of the livestock, the buildings, uh, obtaining the firewood, hunting, fishing. Uh, basically, it's there's two different family economies going on at the same time. There's one family economy that's managed by the husband. There's one family economy that's managed by the wife. But if you put them together, that they work in tandem with each other to create this moral economy. And we have a really cool example of this. There's a woman named Martha Ballard. She lived from 1735 until 1812. And in the late 1800s, or I'm sorry, not the late 1800s, but in the late 1780s, uh, Martha is going to move to Maine with her husband named Ephraim. And she's a midwife in the town of Hollowell, Maine. A midwife, of course, means that she assists in the birth of children. And she left a diary that recorded her daily transactions. When I say diary, it's 27 years of diary entries. There are more than 10,000 of them. And it talks about the household economy that she made. So it talk, she writes about baking and brewing pickling, preserving, making soap, making candles, spinning, weaving cloth. <clears throat> then it also talks about her actually being a midwife. Within her diary, she, talk, she talks about um, delivering over a thousand children. Somewhere close to 2,000 kids are either brought into the world by Martha Ballard or she is there to assist another midwife. <clears throat> so if you ever want to see what this moral economy was really like, her diary is available. It's 
called the midwife's tale the life of Martha Ballard based on her diary. Eventually, though, this moral economy is going to change over to a market economy. The idea of capitalism is going to take over. And it's really <clears throat> the early 1800s, late 1700s, that early capitalism starts to take hold in America. And it becomes all about profit. You know, people want profit. Uh, people are going to begin to grow crops and produce goods for the marketplace, specifically to sell. Any profit received from those sales is going to be used to purchase goods produced by other people. And this is going to become a recurring cycle that just grows and grows and grows before you know it. Uh, you get a, an early form of, of industrialization. Now, where does industrialization actually start? What leads to this change? Well, the early industrialization is going to begin <clears throat> in textiles. Once upon a time in the late 1700s, most of the clothes are going to be made at home. <clears throat> there would be no thought of going to somebody else to get your clothing. It was all made at home by the woman of the house. Eventually, though, there's this system called the putting out system or cottage system that develops. Somebody who owns a mill or has access to resources would send thread to local women in the community and have those local women turn the thread into cloth. And then the mill owner would buy back the cloth from the women. All of that work was originally done in the homes, which is why it was called the cottage system and putting out system. The mill owner would put out the work within the community and then buy back the finished product. Somewhere along the way, the mill workers realized that it would be a better use of time if the women came to the mill instead of sending the work out of the mill to the women. It comes down to really keeping you on task. If you're at home and you just have, say, a week to finish cloth, you're probably going to wait till the last minute. It may not be the best quality cloth. And you might rush to get it done. Whereas if you're under the watchful eye of the mill owner at all times, you're going to work more consistently. You can't wait till the last minute. So these early mills, they're going to have the women come into the mill. The owner of the mill is going to start watching what the women are doing and it becomes more like a nine to five job so to speak and then there are some mills that are going to have journeymen who cut the fabric there are going to be some mills that have tailors to finish the product and then not only is cloth going to be sold out of these mills but in some cases completely finished clothing will be sold out of these mills too now originally all this work was done using just human power uh, there would be like a spinning wheel that you had to pump with a foot pedal or something like that. But beginning in the 1790s, some of these mills are going to start using water-powered spinning machines called spinning jennies. So instead of having to rely on a person to sit there and pump a pedal, we're going to get water power driving these machines. Now, there's a gentleman named Samuel Slater. I know I don't have them in the slide here, but I just want you to know about them. Samuel Slater, he is going to go into some British mills. Samuel Slater is going to memorize the blueprints of these British mills. And then Samuel Slater is going to come to New England and reproduce these blueprints from memory. And Samuel Slater is going to give the idea of the spinning jenny and a mechanized workplace to people in New England to open up mills. And their product of this is known as the Waltham system of Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, we, we can look at 1813. Uh, there's a company called the Boston Manufacturing Company, and they're going to create the first American power loom meaning a water-powered mill just outside of Boston. Now, the person who actually owns this company is named Francis Abbott Lowell. 
And the town that he creates around his mill is going to become rural Massachusetts. Now, this is a well-capitalized company. There's lots of money. And because there's lots of money, the Boston Manufacturing Company is going to open a pretty large factory for the day. And this 1813 factory that's built in Lowell, Massachusetts, is going to be the first factory in the United States where all the different processes and all the different parts of textile manufacturing are going to be brought under the same, same uh, roof. So this factory is going to do the spinning. This factory is going to do the weaving and the cutting of the finished cloth. And the end result is this Boston Manufacturing Company is going to produce cloth that is so inexpensive that most women in the area, instead of bothering to make their own cloth, they're just going to buy it from them. And that shows that this process, this idea works because the Boston Manufacturing Company began to make money and the cloth that they produced was affordable to others in the, in the community. Now, who are the workers of the Lowell Mill? For this week, if you haven't seen it already, you're going to read a piece about the Lowell Mill Girls. And the women working in these mills, they're usually young. Some of them can be as young as six. They usually work up until their early 20s. And they typically leave the mill, they leave employment when they get married. They go back to work on the farm or, or let their husband do the work, whatever the case may be. Most of the workers are from New England farms and most of the time they're going to be working to make money for a male family member, whether that's a brother, a son, a, a father. Uh, they get to keep very little of the money that they make themselves. The Boston Manufacturing Company uh, creates Lowell, Massachusetts to be kind of this model community. Uh, there are courtyards, there are dormitories, there are places to eat, there are churches. Everything is provided for the, the women working in Lowell. But their landlord is also their boss, so there's a little bit of funny stuff with the money. Uh, the time isn't really theirs. They have to get up at a certain time, they can only eat at a certain time, and they have to go to bed at a certain time. The conditions of the mill are also very cramped. They have a lot of machines jammed in there. Uh, the smaller children are going to take the thread off the machine whenever it's finished, or if the machine breaks, they're going to be sent into the machine to fix it. And yes, the machine is still working while that's going on. In other words, these mill owners are going to take advantage of their workers pretty much in any way they can. We're going to get even further into this idea of industrialization when Mr. Eli Whitney develops the idea of interchangeable parts. Now, what Eli Whitney is going to do is he's going to develop this concept of using very precise machinery to produce exact replicas of existing parts. That meant that parts could be switched without extra filing or extra fitting and you could begin to replace parts instead of having to replace an entire machine. Uh, for example, if you were, I mean, this is kind of an, an absurd example, but I hope you can see where I'm going with it. Let's say the idea of interchangeable parts never happened and your headlight goes out in your car. Today you just buy a new headlight, no problem, that's, but if this had been a world without interchangeable parts, you'd have to buy a whole new car. For his time, Eli Whitney's time, if the wheel on a spinning Jenny broke, you couldn't just replace the wheel, you had to replace the whole machine. Obviously, that's a lot more expensive than just replacing a small part. Now, Eli Whitney, he proved the idea of interchangeable parts worked in July of 1801. In July of 1801, Eli Whitney is going to go before Congress with 10 guns. He's going to take apart these 10 guns, put all the parts into a pile, and then say, guess what? I can put 10 guns together using this random pile of parts, and all 10 guns will fire. 
you know, we put those 10 guns together and we proved that they shot and Congress was just amazed. Companies in the United States begin to import machine tools from Europe. But there's a problem. These machines are very, very expensive and they're not going to be mass produced until after Eli Whitney has passed away. So Eli Whitney, really, he was sitting on a gold mine idea, but he never got to take advantage of it or use it for his own benefit. We're also going to have transportation developments. Uh, roads are going to be improved. You have to be able to transport your goods that you're producing. So roads have to be paved or at least cleared and made passable. And then canals are going to be built all over the country. Even today, water is the absolute cheapest way to ship something. If you've ever been to a port city like Savannah, Jacksonville, Charleston, even New Orleans, stuff comes in and out of the water, in and out of the city all the time. Things have not changed that much when it comes to shipping around the world since the beginning of industrialization. Now the most famous canal that's built, and this is going to be a way for goods to be shipped through the United States, is the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal, it begins construction in 1817 and it's finished in 1825. It cost about seven to ten million dollars in 1825 money, which is a lot more today. And what it did is it connected New York City with the Great Lakes. Uh, going north out of New York City is the Hudson River. And when the Hudson River gets to the city of Syracuse, there was a man-made river or a canal that went all the way from Syracuse westward to Buffalo, New York. By doing that, travel time was decreased and it became quicker and easier to get goods into Midwestern states and into the Great Lakes. How easy did it get? Well, before the Erie Canal was built, it cost on average $100 per ton to get stuff from New York City to Chicago. Well, after the Erie Canal is done, that $100 a ton goes all the way down to $9 a ton. It becomes extremely cheap to get stuff into Chicago and it becomes much, much easier to get stuff to Chicago. And before you know it, Chicago is going to start rapidly growing. It's a city to the north, Milwaukee, is going to start growing very, very rapidly. And today, both Milwaukee and Chicago are two of the most important cities in the Midwest. And by the way, probably haven't been to Milwaukee and you probably don't realize this, Milwaukee is bigger than Atlanta. Well, what about railroads? Well, there are some places that canals can't go. For example, water obviously can't run uphill. It only goes downhill, it's physics. Well, railroads are going to be built beginning around the 1830s and really expanding in the 1840s. Uh, for example, by, uh, you know, in, in 1830, zero miles of track have been put down. By 1850, there are 9,000 miles of track laid in the United States. And then by 1860, more than 30,000 miles of railroad track are in the United States available for use. The railroads are gonna provide a year round all weather system of transportation. Uh, the canals are good, the canals can get a lot of stuff there, but if it's really, really cold, it's a lot harder to use the water. Railroad doesn't care. It goes day, it goes night, it goes wet, it goes cold, whatever. We also get steamships. Um, steamships are going to be important because they don't rely on wind. So steamships can travel when there's no wind, when there's lots of wind, when there's hurricanes, you name it. And it made sailing quicker and you could also have larger ships that didn't need to worry about the the wind. So suddenly we have our factories, we've got these interchangeable parts which makes production cheaper, 
We can get our goods to many places using roads, canals, or railroads. The next development revolves around communication. Uh, we have to have a way to take orders no matter where we are in the country. And so Samuel Morse is going to do two things in the 1840s. Number one, he's going to invent the telegraph. And number two, he's going to invent Morse code to go with the telegraph. Now, this is important because it's going to provide real-time journalism. It's going to provide real-time news, real-time communication, real-time orders, not just around the country, but around the world. The telegraph was the internet of the day. Prior to the telegraph, it would take uh, three to four weeks to get news from New York to London. After the telegraph is invented and after telegraph lines are put between New York and London, that three to four week turnaround is now reduced to about six minutes. The world is much, much smaller after Samuel Morse invents the telegraph. Now cities, cities are going to become increasingly important as industrialization takes hold in America. New York City is going to become the main port for the country. Other places like Savannah or Charleston or Boston, they will remain important, but New York City is going to become the primary port in today New York City's largest city of the country. Urban centers such as New York or Boston, they're going to become centers for financing. That's going to be where all the banking is done. That's going to be where all the credit is given, where all the investors are. That's why the New York Stock Exchange is in New York City, not just because of the name, but because that's where a lot of the business was done. Cities are going to grow two different ways. The first one is internal migration. People are going to move into the cities from the countryside to take jobs. But there's a second reason, and that's external migration or immigration as we know it better. And that's going to come mostly from the Irish in the 1840s and Germans in the 1850s. So the Irish are going to come to America in the 1840s because there's a famine the potato crop fails in 1846, 1847, and 1848, which causes a lot of starvation. And then there were just no jobs in Ireland at all. Today, in 2021, America has a larger Irish population than Ireland itself. The other immigration is going to come from Germany. And that's because in 1848, there are a series of revolutions that happen in Germany and they don't work. So people who were on the wrong side of the revolution moved to America to try and save their lives. This is also going to be a, port, a period of history where corporations begin. So we go from you know privately owned businesses to these larger and larger corporations where there's a bunch of investors putting money in. We also have the federal government investing heavily in business, especially American-owned business. And we also have state governments building roads, improving transportation, and improving banking. All right, this is all for this video. It's short, sweet, and to the point. I do have one more video for this week. It is going to be on Andrew Jackson. So make sure that you not only watch this video, but you watch that next one as well. And then also don't forget, there is an extra credit opportunity, five points added to your midterm exam. If you send me an email saying, hey, Mr. Kennedy, I watched this video, but that email has to be received before 11.59 p.m. Monday, July the 12th. All right, we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.